perhaps you can give our listeners a taste of why and when causal modeling is helpful. At Lyft, there were things like rider rider happiness and retention versus like you know driver earnings and, and driver retention. You need to understand how when you change things, it changes multiple aspects of your business at the same time. Um, and so that's what causal modeling is really all about. It's just understanding the consequences of your actions and making appropriate trade-offs. I'm trying to work on casting a lot of the questions that we, we try to ask and answer in the analytics space as causal questions. Um, and I, I think that we don't often formalize them that way. And uh, when you do, it's very fruitful. It starts to kind of shed some light on what you're really trying to do when you're, when you're measuring things. Sean Taylor, welcome to the Super Data Science Podcast. Where in the world are you calling in from? Thanks, John. Glad to be here. Uh, I am in my parents' house in Philadelphia, where I grew oh, up. Oh, no kidding. Uh, so we're in the same time zone. I'm, I'm in New York, and I was expecting you to be on the, west, on the West Coast. You're usually out in Oakland, I guess. I do live in Oakland, uh, visiting the East Coast to see some family for the last couple of weeks. Um, so yeah, it's a little bit of a nostalgia tour, just being in, being in the parents' house and everything. <laughs> Nice. Well, they've got a the the sound in whatever room you have in your parents' house here is great. We lucked out. Uh, no no echo at all. So perfect. Might be the one thing that still works in this house. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we know each other through Sarah Catanzaro. She was in episode number six hundred one. She had this brilliant episode about venture capital investing in data science, um, and she. Uh, she, she was just, just this incredible speaker and she's been super helpful with us also for lining up subsequent speakers. So a couple of weeks ago, we had Dr. Emre Ketchman on the show, whom I think you also are aware of. Um, I know Emre, yep. Yeah, so that was in episode 613. And then you and Emre and uh, another recent guest, uh, Jennifer Hill in episode 607, you're all causality experts, so we've got this nice string. I think you're you're the third in the trilogy <laughs> of causality experts. Um, I hope to say something novel after those two. You, you know, probably hard to hard to follow those acts. Oh no, I have no doubt. Based on the questions that we have lined up for you, I know that you are going to be complementing um, all the causality discussions that we had in episode six hundred seven and six thirteen. It's going to be a lot of fun. Um, but before we get into uh, causality. Let's talk about what you're up to. So your LinkedIn profile has been saying for the last few months that you've been working on this quote unquote new thing. So Sean, can you spill the beans for us on air as to what this exciting <laughs> new thing is? I guess I, I set myself up to, to have to reveal this today. <laughs> it's been it's been really, really tough not to tell people what I'm working on because I, I always tell people like the, you know, the two joys in work are like doing the fun thing and then telling people about it. And I haven't gotten to do the second part for quite a while. So yeah, a couple of months ago, I, I joined a startup called Motif Analytics uh, as a co-founder. Um, and uh, I am the chief scientist at Motif Analytics. So uh, some people may have heard of us already. We, ha we have a website and a few blog posts, but, um, you know, we're, we're still building some awesome stuff. And I'm, I'm really excited about a further reveal maybe later this year and, you know, showing nice. what we've actually been doing. Yeah, congrats. It, the website looks great. The product idea looks great. We'll talk about that in a second. The founding team looks great too. It seems like you're on to something big. So how did you decide to work on this? You haven't worked at a smaller company like this before. So why was now the right time for you? Well, I guess I've been thinking about joining a small company for a while, but, you know, never really quite pulled the trigger. Uh, I, I like big companies. I think it's fun to work with a lot of, you know, on a, on a well-defined problem with a big team and have a lot of resources. Uh, I think the thing I've always kind of wondered about is how fast you could move if you had way fewer people and, you know, you had really high alignment on what you were doing. Uh, and, mm -hmm. and working on some green space stuff was always really exciting to me. So I uh, always had this little startup FOMO and then uh, finally got to uh, now it's no longer FOMO. I'm not missing out anymore. Um, <laughs> and and it's been every bit as exciting as I thought it would be. I think it's it's just so much fun to have, um, you know, something that's not done yet uh, to work on. Like when I showed up at Lyft and Facebook, I think both of those companies are, had already been successful and were likely to be successful if I weren't there or not. But here the work we're doing is like quite pivotal to, you know, to what, what product will actually build in the long run. And so what does the chief scientist at Motif do? What are you responsible for? Yeah, that's a that's an interesting question. I 
we, we debated what title I would take uh, when I joined, and I, I think chief scientist is a good one. Um, I kind of copied after Yuri Leskovic is a, is the chief scientist at his new startup, um, and I kind of was like, hey, you know, if he's a chief scientist, I think I, I'm doing a similar role. Um, we have a CTO and a CEO already, and um, so the product and engineering, I think, are really well covered uh, by Misha and Theron. Um, and uh, I think that the, the question is, like, what does science add beyond engineering? And the, the product that we're building, really the target audience is data scientists and, and analysts. And um, in some ways, I think I'm kind of like the voice of the customer. So trying to make sure that I, I channel those requirements. I've, I've been at these companies. I know how these people work. I really want to build the best tool possible for them. Um, but then also the tool itself is meant to impart like a really strong uh, opinion about how to do data science and analytics um, in a correct way. And in particular, the kind of um, infusing it with this uh, idea of that we're trying to answer causal questions for our customers, um, which requires a lot of rigor um, and being careful about, you know, how we present results to people. And so in a lot of ways, I think of it as like, if, the, if we succeed at this tool, it will be like as if you had, you know, me helping you do your data analysis <laughs> uh, at scale. So, so we'll have lots of customers, they'll be happy using the tool and they'll have correct, you know, results and be getting good causal inferences to the questions that they have. Nice. So you're kind of chief customer. <laughs> chief customer, uh, yes. <laughs> and so did you ever have any debate either in your own head or with the founding team about whether you would be chief data scientist or chief scientist? That's an interesting, like, it, it, there's, I, there's, it's a subtle difference in a lot of cases, but I wonder if you spend any time thinking about it. Uh, you know, I, I guess I never really considered that, but it was, I guess chief data scientist was maybe a little bit of a mouthful. And so we just yeah. want chief scientist. But yeah, I, I think the the interesting bit is like, am I actually doing science? And, you know, maybe maybe it is more like data science than science. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it seems like, I, I don't know. I don't know how we define these relatively nebulous concepts, but I think data science, you could consider like a subset of uh, science. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, so... Um, so you could be doing data science, but you could also be doing chemistry in the future. It leaves that option open for you. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Physics, biology, yeah. many, many options. Nice. Room um, for future pivots. <laughs> exactly. Um, so you mentioned that you will be answering causal questions there a little bit. So that kind of gives some insight into what Motif is doing. Um, you were saying that that's the kind of thing that you want your customers to be able to, um, to be able to get to basically have you kind of in there. Uh, doing their analysis for them in an automated way and answering causal questions. But just before we get to causal questions, there's something about the kinds of analytics that Motif specializes in. And it's actually related to the name of Motif, which is yep. that the firm specializes in sequence analytics. So how is that different from analytics in general? Yeah, I think... Uh... You know the, the major insight that we're we're trying to work around here is that um, when people are using apps and services, they generate a sequences of events that capture in a really rich way what what they're doing while they're using sites and services, whether they're succeeding at what they're trying to do, you know where they might be encountering some friction or or bad user experiences, um, and that like a lot of tools and techniques aren't really able to work with sequence data in a native way. Um, and then frequently they're kind of compressed into metrics. So we're, we're very good at like counting things and taking averages and, you know, making kind of like a, a time series plot of like how many people are doing certain things. Um, but then in this disaggregated form, actually, there's much richer information available. Um, and most of it just gets discarded. So, you know, in a lot of ways, uh, probably one of the biggest potential unlocks for a lot of these teams is being able to use more of the data that they're already collecting. Um, and this kind of like log event data is very common in practice, but, but frequently when people work with it, they kind of have to flatten it into cross-sectional form first. And so uh, I think we're, we're really working on kind of defining what this space looks like, but it has a lot of potential because it's, it's kind of a middle ground between time series data and cross-sectional data. And time series data is sort of like aggregated around the time dimension and we're capturing like aggregate over many people. And then cross-sectional data is like aggregated over time into the user dimension. And so we get this like slice in time. Um, and so is there a middle ground between those two things that can kind of get us the best of both worlds? And, and I think the answer is yes. Cool. So uh, one of the obvious kinds of sequence data to me is anything that unfolds over time. It seems like that's a lot of what you're going to be dealing with. Um, and that's really important in a lot of business applications. Obviously we have, you know, sales change over time, revenue changes over time. Um, 
you can <laughs> yeah, think pretty much anything you can measure, you can count over time uh, since time is always passing around us. Um, but are there other kinds of sequences that we could also potentially analyze with your tools or is, is time kind of the main idea? Well, you, you would think about a user, a time, and a, and, a, and a tag would be the simplest kind of data that we work with. So, um, you know, when, when a user starts using Google, uh, you know, they start typing, they might click search, then they, they choose to click on some results. So there's a little story encoded by that set of actions. Um, and uh, and, and that's, that's a powerful data format. It's also very universal. Um, and and uh, I think it, it applies to almost anything that any any website or app that has logging enabled is something that I think we should be able to help them at some point um, work with their data. Nice. So for now, the tools might not apply to things like natural language sequences or like an audio sequence or a genetic sequence. Uh, it's, right. it's specific to kinds of like temporal events, right? Right. Yeah. We. I mean, we've been we've been calling it event sequences. Um, but the, yeah, it is funny when I you know first tell people I work on sequence analytics, they ask me about genomics a lot. It's kind of one of the first thing that first things that, <laughs> that comes is to mind. that's what <laughs> popped into my mind first too. But I did a genomics PhD, so I was like, is that just me? Yeah. Well, we're trying to borrow some ideas from those fields, and I think there are some some relationships. Um, pro probably the biggest distinction is that like regular sequences, like text um, or genomics, have like sort of a fixed frequency of sampling, whereas like um, right. you know, gen events generated by a user interacting with the platform uh, are kind of like have a timestamp associated with them and can be dispersed over time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so uh, I'm not sure how much this factors in with your product, but something with event analysis that can often be really tricky is the events that we're most interested in often occur quite rarely. So um, if we think about kind of a binary label in a lot of different domains, we have the positive label might occur very rarely, like one in one in 100 events or one in 1,000 events relative to the negative label. Does that end up factoring in with any of your kind of analytics? Uh, I mean, certainly we're very interested in kind of, you know, drilling down into very specific situations uh, that users might be in when they're using a product or service. Um, and, and yeah, those situations are often quite rare and they're defined by sort of uh, certain patterns of behavior, like, you know, cl clicking into a deep, deeply nested menu or deeply nested funnel. And so, yeah, I think there is a kind of ra rareness problem that, that we encounter. And, and that's why we work with this very disaggregated form of the data. It's sort of we're, we're assuming that the interestingness is happening kind of in the corners of your app and we'd like to kind of help you find that. Nice. Today's show is brought to you by Datalore, the collaborative data science platform by JetBrains. Datalore brings together three big pieces of functionality. First, it offers data science with a first-class Jupyter Notebook coding experience in all the key data science languages, Python, SQL, R, and Scala. Second, Datalore provides modern business intelligence with interactive data apps and easy ways to share your BI insights with stakeholders. And third, Datalore facilitates team productivity with live collaboration on notebooks and powerful no-code automations. To boot, with Datalore, you can do all this online, in your private cloud, or even on-prem. Register at datalore.online slash SDS and use the code SUPERDS for a free month of Datalore Pro and the code SUPERDS5 for a 5% discount on the Datalore Enterprise Plan. And so now <laughs> it's finally come time for a topic that we're going to be talking about a lot throughout your interview, which is causality. So you have this impressive background in causality. What's the relationship between this causality background and the sequence analytics that you're now getting into at Motif Analytics. Right. Um, so the probably the most important relationship is that I, I think I'm trying to work on casting a lot of the questions that we we try to ask and answer in the analytics space as causal questions. Um, and I think that we don't often formalize them that way. And right. uh, when you do, it's very fruitful. It starts to kind of shed some light on what you're really trying to do when you're when you're measuring things. Um, and so there's, there's sort of like what I would call like forward and reverse causal questions or causes of effects and effects of causes. Um, and so one of them, the forward causal questions are things where you sort of like know what you changed about what you're doing and you want to kind of answer the, what, what happened as a result of the change that we made. So say you, you know, you launched a new feature or changed your design of your site. Um, you might be interested in how that changed the patterns of user behavior. And so that's a causal question. Like what, what mm -hmm. happened when I changed something? Um, and then there's these like uh, 
causes of effects kinds of questions where uh, you notice something weird is happening and you'd like to trace it back to some underlying thing that may have may have been the root cause of that thing. Root, root causing is another, another term that's quite co common for that. And so when you start to cast those as causal questions, it really sheds some light on what you're trying to do analytically. Like what, how are we analyzing the data in order to, in order to produce an answer to that question? Um, and sequences are a very fruitful way to do this because the temporal ordering of events actually implies something about, uh, the, you know, yeah. what, what are like, what are, what are potential causes of effects that you've noticed or what are potential consequences of things that you've changed? You probably don't have to account for time travel in your models and things in the future impacting no, things in the past. So far, we're not aware of any, <laughs> of any applications for that. <laughs> gotcha. Um, okay, cool. Well, that makes a lot of sense. And then we will later in the show dig into more uh, causality questions. But I love already we kind of understand what Motif is about. These causal questions allow us to not just um, get reports on sequence data. So we don't just have the what, we have the how or the why. I think that's kind of the main idea of how causality is being applied uh, I, in Motif. I, I love that summary. Yeah, the why is really what we're trying to get at. I think that's the most important thing that often people are looking at. And, and we are trying to draw a pretty strong distinction between a lot of uh, analytics tools are mainly focused on this reporting use case. And um, and I think we're we're focused more on the, the cause effect relationships, um, and and that's that's what we think is more actionable for people and, and likely to provide more benefits. Plus, the reporting and counting things space is already really well covered, and I think we have lots of great tools there already. Nice, yeah, that makes perfect sense. Um, so yeah, so we will come back to uh, causality again later in the show. Um, we'll just put a little bit of a pin in it for now to talk mm -hmm. a bit about this specific transition that you made to Motif Analytics. So Sean, how are you finding it working at the small company like Motif relative to the big companies like Lyft and Facebook that you've been at before? Well, uh, there's a lot of differences. I mean, we have um, we don't have a product yet, so probably the urgent thing here is to build a great product and make <laughs> sure that uh, it, it makes our users happy. We, we also don't have any formal customers yet. We have design partners that we're, you know, we're working with, but uh, that sort of like un, you know untethers the work in a lot of ways. You have to have a lot of focus on on your problem and um, and you know creating alignment between people on the team is challenging. And you and you don't have a lot of resources, so you're sort of working with a much smaller set of people. Um, but the you know the flip side of that is you get to work very quickly um, and can kind of like do cheaper tests of things. So we, we're really into kind of like a rapid prototyping culture where we can try new ideas really quickly, see if they work. If they do, we keep them. If we don't, we throw them away. And I really enjoy that. I think you learn very quickly in an environment like that. Um, at, a, at a big company, I think things are slow moving almost by, by default because you have to be very careful and intentional about how you test things. Like preparing for launching or testing something at Lyft might have taken several weeks or months um, because we had a whole marketplace that needed to stay healthy and we, you know, we needed to very carefully introduce changes. Now we're in this very like high entropy state, and uh, I, I personally find it really rewarding and fun right now. But I am looking forward to the state where we we have some people giving us you know uh, more feedback about the product. Nice, no doubt. Yeah, that's an exciting early part of the journey in the startup adventure. Um, and then, so one kind of final question um, related to Motif and the kind of work that you're doing there. Um, so previously, when you were at companies like Lyft and Facebook you were primarily the kind of, the questions that you were thinking about solving were related to uh, specific company problems. So you would have been trying to maximize revenue or optimize profitability. Um, and so the products the machine learning models that you'd be building would be related to tackling those kinds of company problems. But now from my understanding of talking to you before we started recording at Motif, you have this perspective of thinking about it from the user's perspective. So you're in that, you're wearing your chief customer hat and you're thinking about what would my customer most need? So you're thinking about it, you're building tools for people instead of just tackling a specific company problem. Right, yeah, it's been a quite a mindset shift. I mean, um, there's always a little bit of a tension between you know, focusing on a very specific problem for a long time versus trying to kind of synthesize across you know, many of them. Um, and uh, I, I did enjoy being like when I, when I was at Lyft, I called myself a student of ride sharing. I spent the whole you know three years that I was there just really deep diving on one specific topic. 
now I had to, you know, be a little bit more of a generalist and, and try to see what's common between the different people that we talk to, what's common about their problems and what can we, what can we generalize about it? Um, which, which are, which is a little bit of like, you know, dabbling, like I have to kind of quickly understand and, and try to see what's similar. Um, and there's a little bit of an unsatisfying aspect to that. And that we have these design partners and I, I can't go deep on their particular business. Um, I have to try to figure out what, what it is about that, that we can help them, help them solve. Um, it's a, it definitely is a mindset shift, um, but it's fun. It's, it's really fun to, to start to think about this diversity of problems and what's similar about them rather than kind of sticking to one for quite a long time. Nice. Sounds very cool. Uh, I'm excited to see how the motif adventure plays out uh, over the coming so years. <laughs> <laughs> um, so before motif, uh, so most recently you were a data science manager at Lyft and you were the director of Rideshare Labs and several data science initiatives ranging from experimentation to simulation in reinforcement learning. Very cool problems. Um, what kinds of business problems were you tackling with these kinds of things? So how were you using simulation and reinforcement learning, uh, which sounds like a really fun thing to be working on. Uh, so was that, <laughs> it seems like the kind of thing that I might, if, if I was there, I might be like, all right, I really want to be doing uh, reinforcement learning simulations. Uh, how can I come up with some kind of commercial objective <laughs> to apply it to? <laughs> Yeah, I think like Lyft has got the benefit of um, the problem doesn't change. It's kind of been very similar for many, many years, uh, you know, and, and the core problems of, of Lyft are, are quite simple. It's to it's to charge people the right price and then to match riders to drivers in the most efficient way possible. Um, so it's, you know, operating a marketplace is a it has has some core problems that sort of persist over long periods of time. And so you can afford to spend many years kind of trying to develop the best possible technology um, to solve those problems. And, and the benefits have high multipliers, right? Even a small improvement in efficiency multiplied by like all the different markets that Lyft operates in and all the time that you get to benefit from the improvements is quite high. So you get to do this kind of like top of market style research where you really go into the most advanced techniques and iterate upward to you know the the best of breed kind of stuff. So, so yeah, the two big problems that I worked on um, most recently at Lyft are, are these uh, marketplace problems. So dispatch is, is one part of Lyft system that, that decides on which riders get matched to which drivers. And it's a, it's a giant, gigantic design space. I mean, every single time, you know, you make a request with Lyft, there are many possible drivers that you could be matched to. And, um, each one of those match matches is a potential world that Lyft could live in. And some of those worlds are better for that rider. And some of them are worse for that rider. And, but they have consequences for the rest of the marketplace as well. Um, and mm -hmm. likewise with with pricing, you know, increasing in uh, or lowering prices uh, contributes to an individual rider's experience, but then has these spillovers on other people by taking up drivers or relocating drivers into different places. Um, so it's such a complex system that um, you know simulating things and trying to understand things from that perspective is a is a very fruitful way to to, to try to understand it. But also running lots of experiments and trying to you know try new things in a controlled way and see what you can learn from a, you know running a different version of the Lyft algorithms in contained situations. Um, that is super cool. So something that maybe you were even involved in, something that is a relatively recent development, at least from my experience in New York on the Lyft app, is that for a very marginal price increase, like a dollar, I can get this like priority. Um, I can uh, like I can be prioritized, and they often write in the app. It'll you know it'll say what the difference is, and some it's often saying like okay, I could get a car in four minutes with the priority, you pay an extra dollar, or get a car in five minutes without the priority. But in practice, I find that when I spend that extra dollar, I get a car right away. Like it's like a minute. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so I tend to do it. Uh, Cause I'm like, is, is a dollar worth like five minutes of my time? Or like, did I get to like, be at this first date five minutes early as opposed to just on time? And like that, like level of relaxation is definitely worth a dollar to me. So I guess it's those kinds of problems, like figuring out, you know, can we make this marketplace um, more efficient by allowing people to have more options um, and experimenting with those kinds of things? Yeah, it's uh, I mean, what you're describing is is kind of a classic uh, Lyft product idea, which is sort of to try to figure out who's willing to be patient and wait and who's who is in a hurry. And, you know, without having that option, we don't really know. Lyft can't decide. And so they can't match the closest driver to the person who actually is the most impatient. Mm 
-hmm. And, you know, you by willing to pay a little bit of a higher price or revealing that you're in a hurry and you need to be somewhere more quickly or that your time is more valuable to you and to other riders. Um, and so there's, there's, there's ways in which that's helping the marketplace be more efficient by sort of like, um, letting, letting somebody who's willing to wait, wait a little bit longer. And then there's a little bit of slack created by that. So yeah, yeah, there's lots of fascinating product ideas that can be tested and they all have huge marketplace implications and even like deciding whether it should be a dollar or $2 or $2 and 17 cents or whatever is yeah. also sort of a policy decision that Lyft has to decide. Yeah. And it's like dynamic. It seems like it, it depends, I guess, on, uh, rider and car availability. It seems like it doesn't seem like it's a fixed difference. Let me right. Guess. No, no, no. It's it's probably not. And there's a there's an algorithm that decides it, and that algorithm has parameters. And choosing those parameters to make the market the most efficient that it can be is a is a pretty tough problem. And that's what I spent a lot of time thinking about. <laughs> cool. Um, so, uh, as a data science manager there at Lyft, uh, clearly with the kinds of sophisticated modeling, reinforcement learning simulations you're doing, uh, you need a solid foundation both of the right people. Uh, clever data scientists that can do these kinds of advanced uh, simulations, for example. And you also need great systems. So in order to run these kinds of experiments efficiently, um, to be able to gather the data that you need. Um, and then I imagine with things like a simulation, you know, even having um, the, the reinforcement learning environments easily available and usable by the people who need them, um, yeah, I guess, uh, um, what key investments does an organization need to make um, in order to reach that kind of great solid foundation that you had at Lyft? Um, like what kind of, yeah, what kinds of things could uh, listeners be doing at their own company to be building to that same kind of um, great foundation that Lyft has? Yeah, that's a, it's an excellent question. I mean, and I, and I wouldn't say that we were we were totally succeeding at all those things at, at Lyft, but I, I I'll tell you what we were trying to do. Uh, number one is yeah, an investment in platforms and you know recognizing when you have a problem that's not going away and making the requisite investment to solve it in a way that's good in the medium and the long run. In addition to like you know and you sacrifice something in the short run to do that. Building a platform means waiting you know months or years until something's ready, and then you know that you have some trust that when you hit the point where your platform is mature, that you're going to get all the benefits from that. Um, so we've worked on this, you know, Bayesian optimization system for our experimentation platform, where we could introduce these continuous parameters and run experiments that would vary those in a rigorous way and, and converge toward the better values. And you know, it takes it took over a year to, until we were running like experiments like that at a high at a high bandwidth, um, and it was because we had to make a big uh, long term investment up front. Right. And part of that isn't just the technology; it's the culture of kind of acknowledging that um, that these long-term projects are the future of the company and they, they pay a big long-term dividend. And so you have to kind of pay a lot upfront. And so you have all these people working on things that you're not going to benefit from in the short run, but that like leadership is okay with that. And you're willing to reward people and, you know, keep them incentivized to, to do projects like that. It's hard at tech companies because I think people often want to have this like six month review cycle where a project is successful within six months and people, get, you know, get promotions and get bonuses and raises within six months or a year. And sometimes these problems are just like fundamentally more difficult than that. Um, and that's culture. I think you just need to sort of, you know, keep people uh, eyes on the long-term prize. Um, and then doing that while, you know, you have a short-term business that is very volatile. I mean, like Lyft is a company where there's like, there was COVID while I was there. And so a lot of people stopped right. riding Lyft. And right. that is something that you feel like you need to immediately drop everything and respond to. But if you keep your eyes on the long term, you say like, hey, three or four years from now, COVID will be over. And we really wish that we had built this platform. Um, uh, so the culture was a big part of it as well. Also, I guess the, the third thing would be like assembling the right people, which is a really hard problem. It's like oh, what yeah. complementary set of skills do you need to solve problems like that? And like, yeah, like, you know, reinforcement learning researcher from a top university would be a great person to add the lift, but they're not going to be super productive unless you have somebody who really understands the engineering or the, you know, the idiosyncrasies of the data that are being produced by a company like Lyft. So you just, you need like such a diverse set of skills um, to make projects like that work. Nice. Trying to create studio quality podcast episodes remotely used to be a big challenge for us with lots of separate applications involved. So 
When I took over as host of Super Data Science, I immediately switched us to recording with Zencaster. Zencaster not only dramatically simplified the recording process, we now just use one simple web app, it also dramatically increased the quality of our recordings. Zencaster records lossless audio and up to 4K video and then asynchronously uploads these flawless media files to the cloud. This means that internet hiccups have zero impact on the finished product that you enjoy. To have recordings as high quality as Super Data Science yourself, go to Zencaster.com slash pricing and use the code SDS to get 30% off your first three months of Zencaster Professional. It's time for you to share your story. That was an awesome answer. I'm so glad that we had that question to ask you. Um, yeah. And uh, so sticking with Lyft, but going back to what will be our recurring theme of causality. Um, so as with <laughs> all of the rest of your career, it seems, uh, a theme throughout your work at Lyft was the application of causal modeling. So several of your talks and podcast appearances detail this subject. Um, perhaps you can give our listeners a taste of why and when causal modeling is helpful beyond just having an understanding of the correlation between um, two variables. Yeah, it's a causal causal inference is a really important lens for for every company because ultimately we care about what will happen if we we change something. I mean, if you don't change things, then the business will continue to function as it did before you analyze the data. And so there's sort of like there's the like completely passive view of data science as an activity where you're, you're a glorified accountant and all you're doing is count, <laughs> counting the events and telling people what happens. But really, I think we, we, we believe that we're having an impact on the business. And so the shortest path to having business impact on the business is to think about how do we estimate what would happen if we were to make certain changes and then choose the one that, uh, that the estimate looks the best for. You know, we want to live in the world that if we made the the best causal inference, a rank of all the causal inferences possible, and we found the one with the best one for the company, we, we choose that course of action. So it's really simple conceptually, but but not until you put it into these causal terms of like, you know, planning to make a change of some kind. So the simplest version of that is an A-B test where, you know, you have two different ideas about what to do in some situation on your app or service. Um, and you want to just understand what, what would play out differently if you chose one or the other. But in, in practice, the configuration space is the way I like to think about it. How many choices that you make that determine the user experience or how, how your service runs is actually quite large. It's not just A versus B. It's actually like a large number of numbers that need to be decided on dynamically in real time all the time. And, uh, and that to me is causal modeling is sort of like we're going to change all these things about. So Lyft has lots of different policies besides um, pricing and dispatch. There's uh, coupons. There's driver incentives. Uh, there's uh, support tickets, how we handle those, um, you know, dealing with offboarding drivers that are dangerous, uh, which creates supply problems, but makes, makes Lyft safer. And all those things are causal questions. Like if we did something differently, what would happen to our service? Um, and the modeling becomes very important because you're introducing changes on a number of different dimensions at the same time. It's not just like everything gets better or worse. There's actually like three or four things that you're trading off. You know, at, at Lyft, there were things like rider rider happiness and retention versus like, you know, driver earnings and, and driver retention, you know, and, you know, safety and reliability or, or other aspects. And so like, you, you need to understand how, when you change things, it changes multiple aspects of your business at the same time. Um, and so that's what causal modeling is really all about. It's just understanding the consequences of your actions and making appropriate trade-offs. Awesome. That was a really great answer. <laughs> Thank you. Um, what a lot about it. <laughs> do you think that uh, all data scientists should be aware of causal methods? Do you think that there's value for basically all of us? I, I really do believe that. I mean, I know that that's an, it's easy for me to say, being the kind of causal inference guy who's always talking about it. <laughs> but, I, but I do think that um, often what we're doing implicitly is, is causal. I saw in the, you know, your Jennifer Hill interview. I think she said something similar that like, we're, we're making, we're implicitly making causal conclusions. So why don't right. we just make them ex explicit and try to actually right. estimate the causal effect that we care about? Um, and even if we can't get it perfect, at least we're, at least we're putting things in the terms that we, we need them to be in later. So um, it, it will benefit almost anybody that works in data science to start thinking about how do I frame this problem that I'm working on as a, as a causal question. Um, and if it doesn't change the answer, then you are already doing causal inference correctly. 
if it does change change the answer, then you weren't doing it correctly and you were probably making a mistake. And so, <laughs> so um, it's, it's probably going to benefit you either way, either in terms of building confidence and formalizing what you're already doing, or, or if it changes the answer, then, sh then surely you're, you're going to do better um, by using a causal, a causal inference technique. Nice. Do you have, uh, <laughs> so uh, up next, we'll end up talking about Profit, a famous <laughs> uh, Facebook causal prediction uh, tool that you were involved with. But uh, beyond profit, are there specific causal modeling tools or resources that you highly recommend to listeners? Yeah, this is a great question. Um, people often ask me for like, you know, book recommendations and, and stuff like that. So uh, probably the one that I'm most excited about is uh, my friend Robert Ness has a new book coming out on Manning. Um, and uh, I ha I have, I've only gotten to read like a little bit of a preview. He's I don't think the entire book is done yet. But uh, that's that's a book that I recommend checking out. I think that like causal inference and causal modeling is less about like a a particular set of tools or methodologies than it is like a holistic way of thinking about um, solving solving problems. It's kind of like we use a number of different tools to do causal models, but you can do a causal model with linear regression um, or or with just like measuring measuring me two means and subtracting them is a valid <laughs> causal inference <laughs> technique. So it, 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 so it really, it really is like it, there's a diverse set of tools that can be applied, but it's it's kind of like the way you frame the problem and set up the problem that that, that that's the important part. Um, and, and obviously, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the kind of DAGs and and Pearl's work and, and thinking about you know building um, these graphs of causality is is a really powerful tool for tr trying to frame the models that you're ultimately going to have to estimate. Um, but also, experimentation is a big aspect of causal causal modeling if, you know the best way to create a causal estimate is to actually run an experiment and do do some randomization and that's a whole other set of methodologies that's like what i would call design based data science where instead of analyzing data that's already been produced by someone else you're designing the data mm -hmm. that can answer the question that you need to answer um and so that's another methodology that i recommend people become very familiar with um so yeah. it's just like it's like ten different things and and nothing, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that latter methodology, where you're really being thoughtful about how you design your experiments, that seems to be Professor Hill's um, preferred way um, about thinking about causal problems. We talked about that a lot in her episode, in episode number six hundred seven. Um, in contrast, um, Emre, uh, Dr. Kitcherman, in episode six thirteen, it seems like. He, uh, he thinks a lot about the DAG. So the directed acyclic graphs um, that allow us to um, explicitly identify how we think different variables are related to each other and then allow the data um, to bear out in that DAG. Um, so two different kinds of um, approaches there for listeners to dig into in those separate episodes. It's great to hear um, your take on it, Sean, and just kind of the general overview that there's lots of different approaches um, out there. Uh, including <laughs> taking two means and subtracting them. <laughs> right. If it was an experiment, that's a great approach. <laughs> yeah, it's. I think For it's sure. like um, it's fun to reflect on this. Like everyone wants to be told there's one, you know, one tool that they should learn, and I, I think ultimately it's it's right right tool for the job, and it's very generic advice. But it's it's why understanding the fundamentals is so much more important than understanding like what how to use a particular tool. Okay, so uh, one tool that a lot of people uh, who aren't maybe deeply involved in causality uh, might have thought uh, would be the answer <laughs> to all of their causal <laughs> problems uh, was profit. Um, so we, we mentioned that a few minutes ago. Um, so before Lyft, you worked at Facebook and helped develop their famous uh, automatic time series forecasting package profit. And more recently, last year on Twitter, you addressed some of the criticism that Profit received for automating a process that is often not one size fits all. Um, and so here's a quote. You said, the lesson here is important and underrated. Models and packages are just tools. We attribute magical powers to them as if their creators have somehow anticipated all the idiosyncrasies of your particular problem. It's unlikely that those creators have uh, thought, anticipated all those idiosyncrasies, and there's no substitute for evaluation. And this was a, that kind of point is something that Professor Hill brought up a lot in episode 607 as well, which is that um, it, I, I'm going to butcher the quote here, but the kind of the concept that she was describing is that 
um, that there are no true causal tools. <laughs> there are only packages for doing causal modeling where you as a human need to be comfortable with the assumptions that are being made. So it sounds like um, that's, that's the same kind of point that you're making there. Yeah, I think um, we always have to interpret any any answer or number that a model or anything else spits out within the context of how how it was created, um, and uh, and di diagnostics are the are the way that we do that. We sort of like pay close attention to does it produce answers that make sense in in situations where I know the answer um, or where where it could have been known what the answer was, and then then you build confidence through through doing that over time. Um, I think when people just kind of like blindly apply methodologies and, and hope that hope that it's going to work that's exactly when we tend to fail and it, it kind of highlights the the problem is that it's it's much more fun and interesting um, and easy to uh to fit a model than it is to ass assess whether it's whether it's good or not <laughs> and di diagnostics and model assessment and model validation is is isn't very fun but it's uh it's probably far more important and i often tell younger data scientists that like probably that you should start with writing down how you're going to evaluate a model before you even think about fitting it. And it's something that we, it's not the fun part. So we tend to kind of like, it's like eating your vegetables. <laughs> we, we tend to eat, eat, eat dessert first in data science a lot of the time. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, we come into this job for the fun, not the data cleaning. <laughs> no. um, I want cool models. Um, so do you have any thoughts on how the data science community can disrupt this tendency that you're describing for conflating tools, especially maybe seeing a single tool as a one size fits all solution to their specific solution. How can we? Yeah. Yeah. One of the one of the things I've really have been enjoying seeing are these kind of like packages or projects that uh, make accessible many different methodologies simultaneously. You know, for for benchmarking or comparison on a, on a, on either on the same problem or on a set of problems. Um, and uh, academics kind of sometimes produce these review papers or you know comparison type papers. Um, I think that this is this is a very valuable thing for us to be doing. Is saying like, hey, we have a variety of tools that have all been developed for the same problems. Let's just like compare them in some fair environment and try to try to do some benchmarking. Um, so the people who build like benchmarking or tool comparison tools um, are, are are doing great service to everybody because they make it easier to facilitate you know le learning about the properties of these algorithms um, in across a wide variety of of, uh, of potential use cases. But then you know generalizing that to your specific. Uh, application is is also going to be a leap even from there. So like you know maybe something works well on nine out of ten data sets, but your data set is the is the tenth one, and so so you can't you still can't trust other people to have done the work for you under any circumstances if you really care about the quality of the result. And and I think that um, things that help us with diagnostics and visualization of diagnostics are probably even even the most important tools. Um, so th those are what I think we should be focusing on as a community and kind of like help. Rewarding people for finding problems and for fixing bugs and for helping to assess things, um, rather than anybody can develop a new methodology. I, th I think that's relatively easy. Um, it's just like whether whether it's good or not um, is is a really hard question to answer, and it takes a long time. So um, people that help us come to some consensus about what works and what doesn't are probably t doing the most important work. Mm -hmm. So now working at Motif, do you end up spending time thinking about? This kind of like so how, uh, yeah, like how can how can the platform how can the motif platform be providing causal insights, but also in a way that's like responsible, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, that, it's a great question, and it's something that I'm I'm kind of grappling with right now. Is uh, how can we make sure that users get good results even if we haven't seen their data before? And I it, the really mm -hmm. my my most honest answer is that I can't guarantee that. Um, right. And I, I think that the best way forward is to be honest about what you, you know, tool, tools that degrade gracefully when they don't know the answer are probably, you know, a good approach to that. So for, forecasting is a good example. If you if you make a forecast, it's okay for your forecast to be wrong. Almost all forecasts are wrong, but you should be honest about how uncertain you are about forecasts that are likely to be wrong. So the uncertainty intervals, confidence intervals for those forecasts could be quite large. And that's a way for you to be kind of uh, intellectually honest, even if you're willing to make a, make a prediction. Um, so with Motif, I think, you know, part of our, part of what we can do is uh, convey our uncertainty about things through how we visualize data and how, how we show it in the tool. Um, right. 
And then I guess our other our other kind of secret weapon here is we're mainly focused on what I would call um, hypothesis generation rather than hypothesis testing. So the burden of proof is a little bit lower when you're when you're looking for uh, opportunities or explanations. It's not like um, you're going to bet the farm on those particular uh, inferences that you make. They're they're just to help point you in the in the right direction. So so for instance, like finding a bug, it's okay to have a really high false positive rate for finding bugs because. Uh, mm -hmm you know, missing a bug is so expensive. So, and then, so like, if you, if you find like 20 candidate bugs and one of them turns into a bug, that's a perfectly reasonable outcome. Um, whereas if it were like, you know, ship this thing a hundred percent of the time is the, is the conclusion that we're, that we're making and we're being really forceful about that, then that can, that can lead to a lot of bad, bad problems. So, so I think there's this kind of like loss function piece to this, which is that it's, it's okay to generate hypotheses as long as you follow it up with a more rigorous study. And I, I think we're often for, uh, within Motif, we're focused more on hypothesis generation than in like directly telling people what they should do. Nice. Yeah, it's actually, it's interesting that uh, data visualization was part of your answer as to how we can avoid making misleading causal assumptions. Because um, when you were talking about how the community at large could be avoiding uh, making these kinds of mistakes, when you talked about data visualization, I was like, that is something that Motif seems to be specializing in from what I've read in the blog post. And so, um, right. Yeah. We, we are thinking quite carefully about that. And yeah, I think visualization, and there's a whole, there's a lot of great um, researchers working on this sort of like, how do we incorporate um, our uncertainty into the visualizations in an honest way that people actually perceive in the correct way? Like Matthew Kay is, is one, uh, Jessica Holman, both great researchers. And they sort of like are, are, are helping us as researchers who are producing um, insights and producing inferences, be more honest and have the best available tools for communicating the results of those things to people so that they don't make mistakes downstream. Nice. So Sean, beyond just causal tools, it sounds like in your role as chief scientist at Motif, uh, you're still getting to be quite hands-on with the data. Are there particular tools that you love or that you're excited about right now that you think our listeners should know about, whether they're causal tools or not? Uh, good question. Um, I'm trying to think if I've had to use anything new. I mean, we're, we're building tools from scratch, and so there's, there's a little bit less using tools and more building them. Um, well, then, I mean, even just kind of telling us a bit about that, like uh, if you're comfortable with it, telling us, you know, what kinds of programming language decisions you make when you're building a platform like Motif from right. scratch. I'll, I'll, I will reveal like one thing that I think has been very interesting. Um, we have spent a long time trying to figure out, could we could we write SQL queries that can answer the questions um, that, we, that we have and that we want to answer with our tool? And the answer has been after many times of trying that, that we probably can't and that SQL is not very expressive language for the kinds of questions that we have with sequences. Mm -hmm. um, and it's it's for like a kind of interesting reason. The relational model sort of assumes that you have this like fixed width output, whereas like sequence data has an irregular um, irregular uh, shape to it. Um, you know, like the, the answer to what sequence uh, you get from a query could be like any length, and so SQL is just not equipped to um, return answers like that. Um, you can hack it with like lots of left joins on top of one another, but it gets very verbose. So we we've spent a lot of time thinking about like how do we query sequence data and what does a query language like that look like? And I, and I think the answer will be very interesting to people that we should mm -hmm. show it to later. Um, cool. So I, I think that's been my primary takeaway is when you really focus on the problem and how you'd solve it in the best way and you look around and you say, has anybody built any tools that could do this already? And the answer is no, it means you're onto something interesting. Um, and I'm, I'm I'm the last person in the world that will try to invent something that doesn't that, that already exists. I will try to find somebody else's work and use it as much as I can. So. I, I spent a long time doing that, and the answer was, I, I don't think anybody can solve this problem right now, and so we're going to have to do it. And I, I think that's a that's a great premise for a startup. I, I hope other people feel similarly when we show it to them. Very cool. Yeah, we're all looking forward to that. Uh, with you behind it, no doubt it will be uh, innovative and useful. Um, all right, and then so another question that I ask frequently on air, um, because I think it's really useful for our listeners um, to have an understanding to this answer which is what you look for in people you hire. So you've been at huge organizations like Facebook and Lyft in the past. I'm sure you had to do tons of interviewing at those organizations. And now as chief scientist at Motif, same kind of situation, um, you're probably uh, you're interviewing people for, for different kinds of roles, probably uh, maybe 
a more diverse set of roles than in the past. Um, And so what do you look for? What are the key things that you look for in hires? It could be heart and skills, soft skills, maybe a taste of both. Yeah, it's a... I've thought a lot about this because I have interviewed. I think I counted at one point. I interviewed like four or five hundred people in my career. <laughs> so it's been it's been quite a number at this point. Um, and uh, I mean, most of those are kind of like formal interviews that are meant to help other people hire. So uh, so I don't think they directly tell me what I should be looking for. But I, I think that like if I had to nail nail down like one thing that is the most important thing, it's intellectual curiosity and people who are excited to learn new things and excited to learn in general. Um, because they pick up new skills and they learn new things quickly and they sort of like are interested enough in the problems that they, they find, they, they figure out how to be interested in what you're working on. Um, and that keeps them motivated and it keeps them like finding problems and, um, and try to identify solutions. And so like, you know, intellectual curiosity is probably, uh, like the best meta skill. It's how you pick up new skills. It's how you, uh, learn what to figure out what to work on, develop taste, um, and what's interesting to you. And I think like if I, when I tell people what I look for on a resume, it's like people who have been through the, the loop of trying and learning and, and, uh, and solving a problem and then moving on to another one. So I, I do like seeing people who have like, you know, some long, long-term experience working on one thing, but I think bouncing around and learning new things is also sort of like a good sign. Um, and, uh, you know, those people have like generalized what they're, what they're learning into many different settings. It's like cr- cross training or something like that. So yeah. <laughs> And then, you know, what you learn on one problem uh, often comes in handy later. So if you learn how to solve 10 problems, then you'll find a little bit from every one of those 10 problems that applies to what you're working on currently. Um, so that's 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 probably the most important thing. Um, I do, you know, I have tended to hire people with PhDs because I think that, like, they have uh, learned to pick up new skills, learned to learn, and also have, like, have a level of focus um, mm-hmm. and and have very, very good communication skills because they need to write about their work. Um but I, I have worked with plenty of people without PhDs and who have been equally brilliant to many of the PhDs I've hired. So I wouldn't say that's, mm-hmm. that's a, that's a sure thing either. Cool. Great answer. I am so glad that I asked that. So speaking of PhDs, you have a PhD. Uh, it's in quite a multidisciplinary subject. It's something called information <laughs> systems. Uh, you did that just a stone's throw for me here uh, in my apartment at New York University. So this information systems PhD is part social science, it's part computer science. Can you elaborate on what that subject area is? Yeah, information systems is a is a fun one. I mean, I I kind of fell into it. I don't think I knew in advance what the what the whole provenance of that was, but um it it comes out of uh the field of accounting. Um you know, in the in the 60s and 70s before computers were kind of like part part of business in general, there were systems to keep track of information within a company. So, you know, like filing systems and and making sure that you could you could answer questions even when you didn't have computer systems. Um mm-hmm. and then as technology started to disrupt the way that businesses uh worked, um and computers started to become mainstream, information systems evolved into the study of how how computers and and information technology is used to improve businesses and ma- and make them better. So it has a lot of a lot of adjacency to maybe like management science um, and operations research. Um, but really, because it has this kind of like it's steeped in this organizations and business uh, sc- business school way of thinking, that it has a lot of like human elements to it. So like, how are people going to use the technology? It's not like the technology solves the problem itself. You right. need people to use it in a certain way. Will they adopt it when you, if you tell your company to start using some new information technology, are they even going to use it? Will they respond in a way that's counterintuitive? And so that's that's where the social science really gets woven in, is that you need to understand like human behavior in addition to the technology itself. And the causal inference side of it basically come, come, comes down to you're going to introduce some new technology or prescribe some new way of, of doing business or changing the way your business operates. You, you should be able to say something about like what the impact of that was or will be in advance. Um, so it does align a lot of my interest, but you really do need to you know understand the, the technologies themselves in, in order to be able to, to talk about these things. So I, so I really was forced to learn all these different perspectives. <laughs> And I, I actually am really glad that I did. I think it sort of played to my, uh, I, first of all, I really have a hard time committing to any one particular discipline. Um, so uh, it's been good for my attention span is that I can kind of bounce around a little bit. Um, but but also I found it to be tremendously effective to borrow ideas from all these different places um, in the course of my PhD. Um, and later when I went to Facebook to work, I ended up hanging out with a lot of uh, people with 
all kinds of varied backgrounds, com um, computer scientists, political scientists, economists, um, and learning from them and working with them became sort of an extension of my PhD is like, how do I borrow ideas from all these other fields <laughs> that I'm working with and see what's fruitful about the way that they think about problems. Um, so it's really been very formative for the way that I approach things that I work on. Sweet. That was a cool answer. Uh, I didn't know much about information systems before, so it was nice to hear about uh, what it is. Uh, it sounds like a great uh, focus for learning how to apply computer science in the real world, which is what you've been doing right. in your career since at right. Facebook, at Lyft, and now at Motif. So sounds like you were doing the right thing. <laughs> yeah, you, I mean, you never know like uh, whether you just tell the story that it sounds like the right thing later yeah, or if it yeah, really, yeah. really was the right thing. But I, I think for me, it, it worked out great. And I'm very proud of uh, having studied that topic. Um, but I, I feel like it was just the start. Like you know, some people think like a PhD is like the, you know, the end of your intellectual life. And I, it was really the start of seeding this idea of like st studying, being a student of the world and, you know, tr treating things. I treated like, you know, my first few years at Facebook as like a new PhD. And I'm, I, I'm, I'm treating this kind of like startup life as like a new PhD that I'm starting is how do I, how do I get like immersed and really become an expert on the topic of building a successful tool that lots of people want to use? Yeah. I mean, this is the thing that I love and probably a lot of our listeners love about the field of data science is that it's endless. Like in our lifetime, you could never hope to capture 1% of the data science expertise out there, especially since more and more people are getting into it and more and more papers are being published. And so, yeah, you can dig really deep into specific kinds of problems. Um, and yeah, as you're saying, be now on to like your third or fourth PhD <laughs> yeah. um, and still just be getting started. Uh, yeah, and still, be, and still being like energized by it, I think is the important part. It's like, do you, you still feel like that's motivating for you? And, and for me, it still is. And I'm, I'm really thankful for that. Um, but yeah, you're right. It's like you could do, if you're doing data science your whole life, you'll never get to stop. Like I'm, I'm fully trained. I think you're never stopped training actually. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and it's cool how we have the wind at our backs with respect to the kinds of applications we can be excited about because there's more and more sensors collecting richer and richer data all over the world every year. And it's cheaper to store those data than ever before. It's cheaper to compute with those data than ever before. Um, people are sharing modeling approaches uh, as open source GitHub in you know exponentially more all the time. And so it is this, it's this really cool career at a really cool time. Um, so we, uh, when we have big guests like you coming up, I post on social media that I will be hosting you. And so I made a post on LinkedIn and Twitter about a week ago uh, relative to uh, when we're filming. <laughs> uh, and, um, and your post had a huge amount of engagement. So people were really excited to hear from you. Uh, over 12,000 impressions on the LinkedIn post. Um, a couple hundred reactions. And we had a great question for you from Douglas McLean. So Doug is a lead data scientist at Tesco Bank. And he says, it would be great to hear what views Sean has about Judea Pearl's work on causal inference and on his book, Causality. It sounds great, but I'm not really sure how practical this book is in a business setting. I read something Andrew Gelman wrote about it along the lines of, I couldn't find anything wrong with the book. I just never found it was useful to me. Uh, and Doug acknowledges that he's probably uh, misquoting Andrew Gelman there a bit, um, <laughs> <laughs> but that that was kind of the sentiment. Um, so Andrew Gelman, for listeners who aren't aware of him, is one of the world's best known statisticians. And uh, Jennifer Hill, uh, whom we've talked about a number of times in this episode, she has co-authored a lot with him, including on a couple of iconic books. Um, so yeah, Andrew Gelman is definitely somebody in the field to, be, to follow. Um, and his opinions uh, carry a lot of weight, as Doug is suggesting here. So um, uh, so that's, that's one thing for you to address. If I haven't already said too much for, for your uh, working memory, uh, Sean, mm -hmm. we've got one other little bit to it, which is that Doug found it interesting that Jennifer Hill never mentioned Judea Pearl in the entire uh, episode of Super Data Science. And so I guess, yeah, he says that he found that confusing. <laughs> <laughs> 
yeah, I have I have like a lot to say about this, but I, I'll try to keep it more succinct. But, so first of all, to give like full transparency is I, I'm a huge Andrew Gelman fan and I've been reading his blog for a long time and, um, you know, just a huge fan of his work and his perspective. Um, and, and I have read Judea Pearl's work and I've gotten into many Twitter debates with Judea Pearl. And, you know, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so Great, I didn't know that. So yeah, so and and you know, Judea Pearl is a brilliant researcher, and his work has been foundational to the field, and it's and it's extraordinarily valuable work. Um, I think that the the problem with his work isn't that it isn't valuable; it's it's that it's just a piece of what you need in order to be a practitioner who solves causal inference problems. So it, it I think it it's sort of like um, sold as something that solves all your problems for you, but it doesn't really have a lot of empirical content. Um, and we're, you know, someone like Jennifer Hill and Andrew Gelman are used to working with data in the real world and trying to answer mm-hmm. problems as a practitioner. And so I, I think they've found some value in, in Pearl's work. And, and I would bet they draw DAGs and, and think about, you know, what, what identification criterion that they're using on a regular basis. But it's just such a uh, such a small piece, I mean, not a small piece, it's an important piece, but but there's so many other problems that are interesting about causal inference uh, that are all like kind of needed to be solved in addition to that, that I, that I think, um, you know, Pearl's work can seem a little bit trivial in, in comparison to those other problems. Like, you know, Pearl often sort of ignores the problem of where you where do you get the data from in the first place? And do you have the ability to intervene or run an experiment? Um, right. And, so ignoring human agency in the in the production of the data that we use to create insights is is really silly to me. It's a big limitation of of that perspective. Is sort of like living in a fixed world where your job is to model it and try to answer questions the best you can with the data that someone already gave you. Um, so Pearl's great. Gelman's great. I think it's just that like it goes back to my. I think you need to know ten things to do causal inference, not one. <laughs> and and so there's no one tool off the shelf that's going to be here's your causal inference tool. Yeah. And, and and I think Pearl might might want really want you to use his tool, and and you probably will. But there are lots of other ones uh, that you're going to need as well. And so that could also your answer could explain why Jennifer Hill might not have needed to talk about Judea Pearl because there's lots of it. It it doesn't surprise me that one causality practitioner would need to mention uh, uh, another specific practitioner. Like there's so, as you say, there's so many different ways uh, to solve causal problems. And especially when you think about the ways that they're doing things. So as we heard in Jennifer's episode, she has this focus on how we design experiments. And when you're designing experiments carefully from the very beginning, you, like you're saying, you could be using <laughs> the difference between means to come right. up with a causal land preserver. You don't need, uh, you know, complex modeling. Yeah, we we tend to focus on um, solving problems that are feasible, which means that the DAGs are often um, simple, uh, and and that's so. And, if, and with the simple DAG, I think Pearl's work isn't particularly useful because it's it's something that like can be solved, th- you know, through uh, you know d- different other ways of thinking about it that are easier for people to reason about. When you get to complicated DAGs, it's like. Are we going to trust the results of a of a causal inference procedure on top of a complicated DAG anyway? And and often the answer to that is no. So Pearl's work is like most useful in the setting where we're least likely to be able to make progress or you know or or proceed with an estimation task. So so it's like I said, I love Pearl's work. I use it all the time. I just think that like you just need to know so much more um, to to proceed. And you know Jennifer Hill's working in very pragmatic places where she's working on real data with real problems and and found it to be not the emphasis of our work. I think that's somewhat revealing. Cool. Yeah, great answer. I'm so glad that Doug asked that. Thank you, Doug. Uh, <laughs> and so we've now talked about Judea's book. Uh, do you have any particular book recommendations for us? They could be re- related to causality or it could be about anything, but I always ask for a book recommendation for my guests. Yeah, I think uh, one I've, I've recommended before that I really like is uh, The Art of Doing Science and Engineering um, by Richard Hamming. I just think that that's such a it's such a great perspective, sort of. So first of all, it's it's one of those like career retrospective type of books. Like you know, he's he's a brilliant researcher who's who sort of made a lot of contributions, and and he's just like trying to synthesize like how did he how did he work on these problems, and what was it like, and what was useful to him, um, and then like you know, marrying together science and engineering and thinking about the relationship between those two things, like the 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 building step and the learning step are so inextricably linked. Um, and, I, and I think Richard Hemming does a great job of, of covering that. And the, and the forewords by this guy, Brett Victor, who, uh, 
who is one of, you know, I don't know what to call Brett Victor. He's, I guess you call him a researcher, but Brett Victor has built some of the coolest technology demos that you'll ever see. Um, and, and has just such a, such an amazing perspective on the relationship between building things and thinking. Um, and so, you know, getting to, getting to read some new content from Brett Victor is always a treat. So highly recommend that book. Cool. Um, great recommendation, uh, unsurprising from someone like you. Um, so Sean, this has been a great episode. I've loved talking to you. Uh, it's felt really easy for listeners don't know this, uh, because we edit the episode. Um, and so sometimes episodes re require more editing, uh, than others. <laughs> and in this episode, during this conversation, any of the retakes that we had to do were because of me, uh, Sean did this entire episode completely flawlessly. Um, and so, yeah, just, you know, really impressive being able to dig deep into causal problems, real world problems, uh, getting to hear about what you're up to right now at Motif. Uh, it's been really fun, Sean. So no doubt listeners will be eager to follow, uh, what you're up to, um, to hear your thoughts. And so, uh, what's the best way that they should follow you? Uh, yeah, probably just Twitter. Um, Sean J. Taylor on Twitter. Um, really appreciate all the people that follow me for all the crazy stuff that I say, but I hope they find it useful. Yeah, it's like uh, <laughs> 50,000 followers on Twitter, which is wild. I always tell people it's just because I've been on Twitter for way too long and for way too many hours. So, <laughs> But I do, I do really appreciate that I, I have an audience like that. I think it's just it's been uh, so rewarding to me to be able to ask questions to that group of people because I do I just get the best answers. So if I, if I sound like I'm saying something smart, it's often because I learned it from people on Twitter. And uh, I'm thankful that those people listen to me and what I have to say. Nice. All right, Sean, thank you so much for being on the program. It's been a blast. And maybe in a few years, we can catch up with you again and hear how the Motif journey has been coming along. Ah, today's episode was a ton of fun for me. I hope you enjoyed it too. In the episode, Sean filled us in on his new machine learning startup, Motif Analytics, and how it aims to identify the root cause of patterns in sequential data. That is the how or the why instead of just the what. He talked about how we can use causal modeling to understand the consequences of our actions and make better decisions with specific references to how Lyft uses causal modeling to inform its dispatch and pricing models. He talked about how big sophisticated experimentation projects like Bayesian parameter searches can require an upfront investment of several months and diverse teams that blend, say, academic reinforcement learning experts with data engineers. And he talked about how the field of information systems blends computer science with the social sciences to build tools that are effective as part of a broader human in the loop system. As always, you can get all the show notes, including the transcript for this episode, the video recording, any materials mentioned on the show, the URLs for Sean's social media profiles, as well as my own social media profiles at superdatascience.com 617. That's superdatascience.com 617. If you'd like to ask questions of future guests of the show, like an audience member Douglas did during today's episode, then consider following me on LinkedIn or Twitter as that's where I post who upcoming guests are and ask you to provide your inquiries for them. Thanks to my colleagues at Nebula for supporting me while I create content like this super data science episode for you. And thanks, of course, to Ivana, Mario, Natalie, Serge, Sylvia, Zara, and Kirill on the super data science team for producing another invaluable episode for us today. For enabling this super team to create this free podcast for you, we are deeply grateful to our sponsors. Please consider supporting the show by checking out our sponsors links, which you can find in the show notes. And if you yourself are interested in sponsoring an episode, you can find our contact details in the show notes as well, or make your way to johncrone.com slash podcast. Last but not least, thanks to you for listening all the way to the end of the show. Until next time, my friend, keep on rocking it out there. And I'm looking forward to enjoying another round of the Super Data Science Podcast with you very soon. <laughs>